Hunger strikes are common and ubiquitous, especially across carceral facilities, such as jails, penitentiaries, immigration detention centers, uh, military prison camps. They have increased, so hunger strikes have increased in frequency COVID-19 pandemic. There has been hunger strikes, riots, escaped, escape attempts all around the world to uh, denounce and protest the um, uh, lack of medical access and inadequate sanitary conditions in the face of the pandemic. I'm interested really in authorities' response here as a starting point. In the US, incarcerated persons who go on hunger strikes are often or usually brutally repressed. They're beaten, they're pepper sprayed, placed in solitary confinement. Migrants on hunger strikes uh, are regularly force fed. Um, hunger strikes are against prison rules. Hunger strikers are charged with um, offenses such as disorderly or disruptive conduct, inciting violence, and participating in a riot. Prison authorities justify these coercive interferences against hunger strikers by appealing to the detainees' life and health, their custodial responsibilities to preserve these, as well as other interests such as um, staff safety, um, protection of, of third parties and the maintenance of prison orders. These are considered state and penological interests. They also conceive of hunger strikes as extortion or blackmail, conduct likely to lead to violence and even asymmetrical warfare in some instances. Human rights advocate condemn the repression um, and, they, and, and other sympathetic observers do that too. And uh, they defend incarcerated persons right to hunger strike. They do that on the basis of what they conceive as hunger strikes, obviously passive, peaceful, nonviolent and non-coercive nature. Um, this general approach characterizes three existing models of the right to hunger strike, which I'll tell you about today. The first one is the medical model, which conceives of the right to hunger strike on the basis of the right to refuse medical treatment as an application of the right to refuse medical treatment. Another one is the constitutional model, which defends incarcerated persons' right to hunger strike on the basis of their freedom of speech. And the third is uh, the moral model, which um, uh, so it's a, the possible application of the right to civil disobedience, which moral philosophers have defended to the case of hunger strikes. The problem, um, th th there are multiple problems with these approaches, which uh, I'll explain today. But basically the champions of these models end up arguably misrepresenting the nature of hunger strike. So in ways I'll tell you about, but I basically take issues with the idea that hunger strikes are obviously passive, peaceful, nonviolent, and non-coercive. These defenders also simply reject authorities' rationales for repression as disingenuous. And I'm interested in, um, taking seriously the charges that authorities um, bring up against uh, hunger strikers, including the idea that they're disruptive and coercive. And more broadly, the uh, champions of these models, and so the uh, advocates of hunger strikers tend to neglect the oppressive power relations that characterize the prison. So that's also something I'll do. I'll um, look in detail at the site of hunger strike prison and uh, the power relations that characterize this site. So this is the roadmap for today. Um, first, I will say a little more about why I think we need an account of the right to hunger strike rather than something else like an account of the justification of hunger strike. Then in the first part, I'll critique the existing medical, constitutional, and moral models of the right to hunger strike. And the upshot of each critique will be um, a more refined and precise um, account of the hunger strike as first a prison protest, second a coercive kind of protest, and third self-destructive kind of protest and resistance. And then I will put forth 
um, a dual two-pronged argument for the right to hunger strike. There is the remedial model and the constructive model. So the first one is an institutional um, kind of argument. So it's an argument for institutionalizing the right to hunger strike as a right to petition for redress given inadequate grievance mechanisms in prison. And um, so that is a kind of policy oriented um, argument that I think should appeal to everyone and should be particularly appealing to the human rights advocates of hunger strikers. I also think it as a, um, it should be a kind of bulwark to the criminal justice reforms and prison reforms that um, a lot of people talk about. Um, the other prong, the constructive model is different. So it's a, it's a radical um, moral political argument for recognizing the right to hunger strike as a human right to resist oppression given um, widespread carceral oppression. And I, I'll explain what that is. And I take these, the, the two models to be, well, it, it may be that you're attracted by one and not the other, but I take them to work well in tandem in part because um, the remedial model works really well to look at hunger strikes that um, seek to obtain redress. So precise grievances for kind of, um, prison conditions that violate incarcerated persons' rights. And the constructive model works um, even better for hunger strikes that exceed that kind of uh, goal and that um, target all kinds of oppression inside and outside the prison. Um, I also think that a constructive model should be particularly appealing to prison abolitionists, whereas the remedial model is really a reformist argument. So let's start. Why a right to hunger strike? Um, on its face, it's really not obvious why we should look for a right to hunger strike because um, hunger strike is a kind of protest. Protests are uh, fine, presumptively impermissible. Hunger strikes are kind of fast, right? They're prolonged uh, food and or fluid uh, refusal. And that's also fine. You do whatever you want with your body. So on its face, there doesn't uh, seem to raise any particular issues of permissibility. The problem is that hunger strike is not presumptively permissible in prison. It constitutes a rule violation there. And so it is incarcerated persons and only incarcerated persons, I think, who need a right to hunger strike. So I don't, although there are of course important um, similarities between hunger strikes inside and outside prison, my focus here is on prison. I think that it is incarcerated persons and only incarcerated persons who need a right to hunger strike. So citizens of um, liberal democracies don't need a right to hunger strike outside prison and citizens of um, illiberal states that don't have the right to hunger strike either inside or outside prison just need rights of political participation or rights of dissent. They don't need the right to hunger strike. Um, but why not simply offer an account of the justification of hunger strike? So it seems plausible enough to just contend that authorities ought not to repress justified hunger strikes, but that they may repress within limits set by incarcerated persons constitutional rights, unjustified hunger strikes. Um, so we would need an account of the justificatory conditions of hunger strikes. And then we would want to say that it's okay for authorities to repress one kind, but not the other. And that in any case, they ought never to deploy excessive force, something like that. So why not do that? Um, first, prison authorities, insofar as they are the target of hunger strikers, should not be entrusted with assessing hunger strikes legitimacy. It's in their interest to the many justified hunger strikes as unjustified. And second, the right to hunger strike should protect justified and unjustified hunger strikes alike because all incarcerated persons are entitled to be treated with respect and care. So as I'll explain in the uh, remedial model, 
the right to hunger strike is not a right to have one's demands granted. It's a lot of other things. And I think it's important to extend these rights and the um, duties on the part of authorities that this right entails to all incarcerated persons uh, in a, a content independent way. So uh, regardless of the possible lack of justification of the grievances. So I'll say more about that um, later, but that's the, the basic approach. And of course, human rights advocates take the same kind of approach. They don't, their defenses are always that incarcerated persons have the right to engage in the protest they engage in and that, and they don't first show that the, the hunger strike is justified also, although they also do that. Okay, the first, um, the first account of the right to hunger strike is the uh, dominant um, model, it's the medical model. It emerges from medical ethics and it derives the right to hunger strike from the right to refuse medical treatment. So the refusal of medical treatment covers hunger strikers refusal of food and refusal of life-saving nutrition in the form of a meal or of artificial feeding. So hunger striking, um, like fasting in general, is permissible because one has dominion over one's body, while force feeding hunger strikers is wrong because it constitutes a non-consensual invasion of agents' bodily autonomy, such as forcing someone to undergo a blood transfusion or a surgery would wrongly violate that patient's bodily autonomy. So the right to refuse uh, medical treatment protects against forced interferences with bodily integrity, even when this would be in the patient's interest. Uh, we find that right in the uh, expressed in the world in the World Medical Association, the American Medical Association, among other um, healthcare professional organizations. They call on doctors to conscientiously refuse to feed hunger strikers when ordered to do so. So they call on doctors to prioritize the patient's interest over their institutional duties as prison doctors, so state employees, and so on. So the medical model also recommends the management of hunger strikes, so offering supervision and medical care, but at, um, never um, accepting to force feed. Um, the problem with the medical model are uh, numerous, but the, one, the problem I'm interested in here is the idea that um, it ignores the site of the hunger strike. It ignores the function of the hunger strike. And it does not protect hunger strikers from non-medical punitive interventions. So it, um, it takes the hunger strike to boil down in essence to a passive refusal, an exercise, a simple exercise of bodily autonomy. And in doing so, it misses what a hunger strike is. But also importantly, it's really limited when it comes to incarcerated persons' rights because it only protects from, not from medical interferences. So it doesn't protect from um, punishing, placing in solitary confinement, and so on. So, or it doesn't apply well to those cases. So it's a very limited kind of... Um, um, principle for uh, dealing with the proper responses and uh, forms of advocacy of hunger strikers. So these, these, these are, um, this is a kind of list of bullet points of things that I take to be fairly uncontroversial about what a hunger strike is, but that the medical model is importantly uninterested in given the, kind, the, given the right to refuse medical treatment. So one, the hunger strike is a symbolic form of speech designed to dramatize agents' deprivation and voicelessness. So it isn't just this passive private refusal concerning what happens to one's body. Hunger strike is a last resort for incarcerated persons who have no control over their environment. The hunger strike is situated in a um, network of power relations. It's often, it's usually undertaken collectively and we need to think that. Hunger strikers in prison both seek, both seek to persuade, appeal to the public, 
and to exert coercive pressure on prison authorities or the state. Hunger strikers' goal is not to continue their hunger strike. This, is, this seems somewhat implied in the medical model, like just let me be, let me do my hunger strike. But that's not their goal. Their goal is not to suffer irreparable injury or die, but die in peace uninterfered with, no. Their goal is to obtain redress and or to radically challenge authorities, as I'll um, argue later on. Hunger strikes often occur at the same time as or are a precursor to other disruptive protests inside the prison, including work stoppages and riots. I say this because one, well, I'll argue that they are, that we need to think their coerciveness, but also because um, this is the kind of, uh, this points to the kind of state and especially penological interest that of prison authorities appeal to in order to um, justify their coercive interferences with hunger strikes. And hunger strikers do intend to disrupt the prison order. Um, we, so again, uh, conceiving of the hunger strike as just a passive um, refusal doesn't uh, take into account this basic feature of the hunger strike. So moving on to the second model, the constitutional model. That derives the right to hunger strike from the right to free speech. Um, freedom of speech is a widely accepted fundamental right of liberal societies, just like the right to refuse medical treatment was a bedrock of medical ethics. And um, the constitutional model constitutes an improvement on the medical model because it does kind of start from the understanding of hunger strike as a form of symbolic speech and protest. So it's important because it gets right the communicative nature of hunger strike. It protects and it seeks to protect hunger strikers uh, from coercive interferences. And on the constitutional model, given um, uh, the, the conception of hunger strike as speech, um, a coercive interference, so not just for speeding, but also other kind of non-medical coercive interferences, or a kind of silencing. The problems with the constitutional model is that, well, it needs to appeal to privacy rights. Privacy rights, especially like the right to refuse medical treatment. So no champion of the constitutional model says that the right to free speech is sufficient on its own to protect hunger strikers against, from coercive interferences. They always also appeal to privacy rights, like so the right to refuse medical treatment having been recognized in US jurisprudence as part of the privacy rights. Um, and um, uh, incarcerated person speech and speech plus conduct can be interfered with in pursuit of a legitimate penological objective. So the second problem is important because it, cons it considers um, incarcerated persons' freedom of speech to be substantially limited in constitutionally protected ways. So it's understood in US jurisprudence that, the, um, that prisons can, in pursuit of their own penological objectives, restrict persons' freedom of speech especially speech plus conduct, which the hunger strike is um, a form of. So, it, I mean, it's not the fault of the constitutional model that um, um, courts and um, the, the, the uh, resulting jurisprudence weighs lightly freedom of speech, but I do take the fact that they always need to appeal to privacy rights to be a sign of a weakness and indeed, to the extent that we recognize that hunger strike is not just speech, but speech plus conduct, we need to be open to these coercive interferences on the grounds that there's this conduct that isn't just speech. So I think that it does um, uh, leave, op leave open the door to authorities' coercive interferences. So what um, do we learn about the hunger strike when we, um, take the problems of the constitutional model seriously, we see that hunger strike is coercive. And again, that's something, so it's speech plus conduct and it's coercive and it's from that uh, kind of framework that we would see how 
the right to free speech might not be sufficient to uh, protect hunger strikers. So what do hunger strikers do? What's discursive logic? Hunger strikers threaten self-starvation to force concessions from prison authorities where they do starve themselves and threaten further self-starvation. They communicate the coercive proposal, give us what we ask or we will starve ourselves. How does it work, right? So it's a threat of self-violence. How can it succeed? It can succeed because authorities have duties of care toward the incarcerated persons. So hunger strikers shift the responsibility for their self-inflicted harm onto prison authorities. They wager that the authorities will prefer granting hunger strikers demands over the alternatives. So letting them die in particular or force feeding them and risking all kinds of reputational costs. So the hunger striker makes it hard for authorities to realize their duties of care. By starving herself, she endangers her health and bodily integrity, which authorities are charged with protecting. So this is just elucidating the coerciveness of the hunger strike. The hunger striker weaponizes that which prison authorities are supposed to care for, but which is ultimately the only thing she has control over, and that's her own body. Um, that's important because the, the, the constructive model, so the remedial model, will not need to deny the coerciveness of the hunger strike and the um, constructive model well, so the, the last argument will show the importance of defending the normative permissibility of coercive uh, resistance tactics to secure one's freedom. Okay, the third uh, model I uh, want to look at is the moral model. This one, there, there's no champions of um, the moral model understood as um, the idea that the right to hunger strike is grounded in the right to civil disobedience. But moral philosophers have defended the moral right to civil disobedience and uh, moral and political philosophers have argued that the hunger strike is a kind of civil disobedience. It's generally classified as a tactic of civil disobedience. So why not think that on this basis, we do have an account of the right to hunger strike, which would be an application of the moral right to civil disobedience. Um, the moral right to civil disobedience is conceived as a liberal right of conduct that entails a claim right against punishment and sometimes also against penalty. So it seems like exactly the right kind of uh, tool for us if we want to defend hunger strikers. Kimberly Brownlee defends the moral right to civil disobedience on the basis of freedom of conscience, given laws potential to burden individual conscience. David Lefkowitz defends uh, this right on the basis of political participation rights as a right to continue to contest the decision reached by a democratic majority. Um, I have two big problems with these accounts, so the moral model in general, but each version of the moral model. One is that hunger strike shouldn't be classified as a tactic of civil disobedience, and the other is that both versions of the model, model ignore and obscure the differentials of power. Um, yeah, I'm not saying anything about that. So um, I, I can say more later about the, the, the idea that they ignore and obscure the differentials of power. But um, to put it in brief, um, it's especially visible with Lefkowitz, um, Civil disobedience are citizens in the public sphere addressing their free and moral equals. And um, they just happen to be losers in the democratic game, the electoral game. And um, this isn't the situation of incarcerated persons. They are subordinated, marginalized, powerless, um, as, I, as I'll go on to explain. And so they are not losers in the democratic game. They were they're not allowed to play at that point when they're in prison. Um, so I think that it's uh, important to really look at the site of the uh, of hunger strike to see why um, an account based on political participation or even freedom of conscience, which kind of subjectivizes acts of conscientious dissent, miss the point of what goes on uh, with incarcerated persons. So 
I'll just focus here with this slide on like why is hunger strike not civil disobedience? Um, what is civil disobedience? It's a public, open, non-coercive, non-violent breach of law intended to persuade the public of the need for reform by an agent willing to accept punishment. So that's kind of a standard um, definition of civil disobedience. Um, it has all the um, elements of John Rawls's definition, although it's not super clear on the question of coercion, but that's about um, uh, as mainstream a, a, a conception as uh, you have it. Now, if you take fast of moral persuasion, which are the kind of hunger strikes outside prison I was um, talking about earlier, you can think of them as non-coercive and non-violent publicly. Just so happens that fast of moral persuasion, especially in a liberal democratic society that protects its citizens' right to dissent, is not illegal. So it's not a, a, an act of disobedience. So it wouldn't be civil disobedience. And hunger strike properly conceived as inside the prison is persuasive to the public, yes, but it's also coercive toward prison authorities, as we saw earlier. It's illegal, but only because the prison makes it so, right? Whereas the civil disobedience uh, by design, uh, agents of civil disobedience by design break a law, the law that they're protesting are another law, and agents are already incarcerated. I don't think they ought to accept punishment because um, that repression is uh, um, not acceptable. I mean, this is a bit question begging, but I don't think they ought to accept the punishment of uh, force feeding or solitary confinement for their protest, especially to the extent that they have warranted grievances and are um, uh, justified in demanding redress. And it's um, neither nonviolent nor injurious to others, but it is injurious to oneself. So it's a kind of self-violence that the um, violence, nonviolence binary um, effaces, doesn't allow us to think. But again, I think it's neither. So hunger strikes belong to the category of self-destructive resistance along uh, activities like leap sewing and self-immolation, which you see on uh, the photos here on the side. Banu Bargu um, wrote, uh, she's a critical ethnographer and political theorist. She wrote a um, book on the death as fast in Turkey, which uh, talks about self-destructive resistance, although she thinks that suicide attacks are kinds of self-destructive resistance. Here, for the sake of um, the talk, I'll just, um, I, I'm interested just in the, I'm not endorsing her old conception, and I'm just interested in the feature that uh, recognizes the self-destructive, self-violent nature of hunger strikes given the infliction of bodily harm to oneself. Um, it's also important to note the corporeal embodied aspect of resistance of the, of the hunger strike here, where the body is the conduit and the canvas as with lip sewing and self immolation and in different ways than in uh, usual acts of resistance. So it's not that um, civil disobedience don't protest with their bodies, but they don't draw attention to it in the same way. Um, that's all I'll say, but again, I'm happy to talk about that. Okay, so we can now turn to the remedial and constructive model. So given, I guess, the elimination of the existing current models of the right to hunger strike. So I want to suggest that the right to hunger strike is a uh, should be conceived as a right to petition for redress. Um, it's a the, so there's widely accepted and recognized as basic the remedial right to petition government to seek redress without fear of reprisals. Um, it um, as its origin in the Magna Carta. It's uh, so widely accepted that it was the basis for um, the uh, so the Guantanamo Bay jurisprudence, where the people incarcerated there as unlawful enemy combatants brought up habeas corpus petitions, which eventually were seen as um, proper um, and given justice irreducibility and uh, quasi-naturalness of the right to petition government. So I think it really has um, this trance 
of uh, being widely accepted and seen as uh, really basic and not something that can easily be limited for the sake of a government pursuing its own goals and interests. So from this remedial um, perspective, we can think of hunger strike as a last recourse in the face of inadequate grievance mechanisms. It's important right there to look at the site of the uh, hunger strike and it's the prison. The prison involves, in, in, so incarceration involves two important elements, which um, Tommy Shelby highlights in his uh, recent work in progress on prison abolition, involuntary confinement of individuals and custody of our individuals. Carceral custody, um, entails custodial responsibilities, like I was talking about, but for the on the side of individuals, it entails their dependence. They depend on um, prison staff and guardians for everything, for their well-being, their welfare, given that because they're incarcerated, they have no freedom of movement, of association, no control over the daily conditions of their life. So if you take custodial dependence and also um, the uh, coercive capacities and discretionary power of prison staff, given their custodial responsibilities, right? So the coerciveness and discretion is supposed to help them discharge their custodial responsibilities, but um, they have a lot of power. They make daily judgments on uh, what the prisoners need, on um, their every uh, calls for help. Uh, they can enforce the rules or not. Given this, and also often some forms of corrupt culture, cultures of impunity, a kind of, um, sometimes it's the homogeneity of the uh, uh, background of the prison guard and their um, attitudes. So for instance, the, um, the army in a, in a military prison camp like Guantanamo all have the same kind of um, aversion or even hatred for the people that are in their detention. So it's going to look very differently in different contexts. But given that, you have a lot of the time, almost across the board, um, the uh, incarcerated persons being really vulnerable to mistreatment and abuse. And this mistreatment and these abuse are um, sadly somewhat well documented. They are not as well documented as we would like given the lack of public transparency of prisons, which Andrea Armstrong, a law professor at Loyola in New Orleans has um, um, studied. So the lack of transparency is important and it and together with inadequate grievance mechanisms, it entrenches incarcerated persons vulnerability to abuse and mistreatment. I also wanna note because I think that the subjective perception is important that incarcerated persons themselves um, um, perceive the grievance mechanisms as opaque and inadequate. Um, I'm just speaking to one, first person memoir by Albert Wood Fox who spent four decades in solitary confinement in Louisiana and a recent interview by Chelsea Manning who was also talking about the impossibility, the near practical impossibility of making one of um, uh, airing grievances and having them heard. So substantial criminal justice reforms are necessary to address you know, corrupt culture and the kind of uh, impunity that may go on with the mistreatment and abuse of incarcerated persons by guard. Um, and that would involve, importantly, the announcement of public transparency, the establishment of robust oversight mechanism, the collection of complaints and serious robust redress mechanisms. What I'm suggesting is that uh, they're central to these reforms should be the institutionalization of the right to hunger strike, should be institutionalized, legally protected as an important piece of the, this better robust prisons appeal system. So the remedial right to hunger strike should be conceived as a bundle of rights, which entail certain duties on the part of authorities. And these include the duty not to coercively interfere uh, with hunger strikers through repress, repression, punishment, or force feeding, 
And then the rest are positive duties, duties to provide independent, high quality medical supervision to hunger strikers, duties to record the hunger strike and the hunger strikers complaints and demands, duties to notify hunger strikers family or other contact person, keep them informed, allow visits, to allow hunger strikers to contact and speak with journalists, so some media access and access to legal counsel as well, and to trigger an inquiry into hunger strikers' grievances by an independent commission. Um, and citizen involvement in such oversight would be crucial. The commission's conclusions should be binding. So something like that. That's obviously a very um, sketchy, uh, proposal here for the, the reform, but I think it's essential that the right to hunger strike be legally recognized and protected to enhance grievance mechanisms. So there is no perfect grievance mechanism that wouldn't include the right, and no perfect prison conditions that wouldn't include the right to hunger strike in recognition of the, the system's own fallibility. So the very possibility that grievances would fall through the cracks. So um, even in a hypothetically really decent prison, there should be, we should recognize the right to hunger strike. And indeed the best, the best um, relatively speaking countries with uh, decent prisons like Norway and New Zealand do recognize something like the right to hunger strike. Okay, I wanna insist that the right to hunger strike needs to protect all hunger strikers independently from the legitimacy or illegitimacy of their grievances. So what I'm saying is that incarcerated persons engaged in unjustified hunger strikes are protected too, right? And as a, it is not part of the list here that the right to hunger strike entails the right to have one's demands met. So um, it's important not to hinge the protection and care of incarcerated persons, not to make it a hinge on whether they are engaged in, a, um, in an acceptable justified hunger strike. Uh, give, and that one not do take the detour of assessing the, whether the grievances are warranted or not. Okay, the last argument. So I'm almost done. Okay, I wanna understand the right to hunger strike as a human right to resist oppression. So we're changing gears here, right? From the remedial model. What I'm proposing here now is not um, to be uh, institutionalized. It is a part of political morality. So why is it important to um, add a constructive model to the institutional model, to the remedial model? Hunger, hunger strikers don't only demand redress for rights violations, but often they challenge, reject, resist state authority. They call for a new normative order, which is why I'm calling the model a constructive model. Um, they call for things like decolonization, freedom of migration, prison abolition. So um, we need a political moral argument for recognizing the normative permissibility and the value of prison resistance in general, which is going to involve coercive tactics and hunger strike in particular to secure one's freedom. So what I need here really to foreground the account is an account of carceral oppression of this unfreedom that um, the human right to resist oppression um, allows resisting through hunger strikes. Oh, it's here. Um, so to be incarcerated, is to be deprived of liberty, to be unfree. Incarcerated persons have no freedom of activity, movement or association, no control over their welfare, as I suggested earlier um, with the remedial argument. Now, some restrictions of incarcerated persons' freedoms may be legitimate, and I'm not here giving an account of those in part, I'm, I'm not interested in that. And I, um, um, I want the argument to be appealing to both prison abolitionists and prison reformists in this form. But um, I, 
I suggest that carceral oppression be the name of the subset of restrictions of personal freedoms or uh, conditions of unfreedom that isn't legitimate, that violate people's rights, deprive them of certain important opportunity. Um, I propose four facets of carceral oppression using the concepts given to us by Iris Marion Young in, uh, uh, in the, the five faces of oppression. So one is violence, which in part um, covers the same um, kind of things that I was talking about with the vulnerability to mistreatment and abuse. Prisons are rife with violence by both inmates and correctional staff in inhumane and unconstitutional conditions and failures to provide adequate and uh, medical and mental health services. Medical neglect has reached severe, even deadly consequences in the New York City jails, especially at Rikers Island. I think that medical neglect is a form of, um, of violence here. And again, we can think of the um, person on person physical assaults as part of that too. The transfer of the results of the labor of one social group to benefit another or exploitation is another face of oppression. Many incarcerated persons are economically exploited. In the US, where approximately half of the 2.3 million incarcerated people work, prison labor is a multi-billion dollar industry. They work for as little as four cents per hour, as long as 12 hours a day, doing everything from heavy manufacturing to staffing call centers, doing 3D modeling, and even working as servants in prison officials' homes. And the very structure of carceral custody breeds incarcerated persons' powerlessness, which Young defines as the institutionalized inhibition of the development of their capacities, and marginalization, their deprivation of opportunities to exercise their capacities in context of recognition and interaction. Young conceives of powerlessness as the social experience that correlates with economic exploitation, and is paradigmatically experienced by the working class. She defines the concept negatively. The powerless lack the authority, status, and sense of self that professionals tend to have. The powerless, in our view, are subordinated in a hierarchical workplace. And those who are marginalized are expelled from useful participation in social life and thus potentially subjected to severe material deprivation, even extermination. Um, not only are they deprived of the means to live a decent human life, but even if redistributive policies mitigate their material deprivation, marginalization blocks the opportunity to exercise capacities in socially defined and recognized ways. Um, so beyond the work-centric accounts, you see, um, it's easy to see how powerlessness and marginalization describe the reality of incarcerated people. The prison renders its occupants powerless and marginalized by design. They lack autonomy, authority, power, and status. They form a permanent underclass, as Armstrong argues. They are deprived of opportunities to exercise their mental, creative, physical, and social capacities. And Kim Brownlee, in her latest work, addresses some of these arms, especially the social deprivation arms. Um, so it's not 2012, sorry, it's 2020 one, uh, being sure of each other. Um, now, carceral oppression is connected to and often a symptom of broader forms of socio-political oppression, including the repression of um, dissent, um, colonial occupation, and so on. And precisely, many hunger strikes target both. And that's also why I think it's important to have a broader account than um, the remedial account. So. Hunger strike under um, our, uh, to carceral oppression, what the work stoppage is to capitalism. I'm here using a um, paper on the right to strike from Alex Gurevich to kind of make this point. Um, he defends the work stoppage as a crucial instrument to resist capitalist exploitation and domination. Um, and he shows how there's both an instrumental and an intrinsic value of resistance in this effort and struggle to secure one's freedom under conditions where freedom interests are, are threatened. So the hunger strike is a crucial instrument of resistance. It protects 
uh, our liberty interests in not facing oppression by effectively leveraging counter power. And that's uh, the course of logic I was talking about earlier. Um, and it's important to note that hunger strikes are effective. There's very little data, but one um, very large survey of thousands of hunger strike that were inside and outside prison showed that 75% of them uh, were effective. Um, of those about, of the data set, about more than a third were in prison. Um, the right to hunger strike, so the hunger strike also has intrinsic value as a kind of demand for freedom and affirmation of dignity and an exercise of moral agency and an act of political self-determination. So even if it turned out that hunger strikes were not effective, they would still have value of this kind of intrinsic value as an affirmation of dignity. That's something that Beruz Bouchani was pictured here, talks about um, in his book, No Friend But the Mountain, which uh, tells his experience at on Manus Island, Manus Prison, an offshore detention center, an Australian offshore detention center in uh, Papua Guinea, I think. Um, and Bouchani goes even further in talking about the transformative value of our refugee resistance. He says this, the, and the refugees engaged in hunger strikes and a, a siege and uh, all kinds of uh, protests, but hunger strike were an important part of the protest against the tyrannical conditions that reigned uh, on the island. The refugees were able to regain their identity, regain their rights, regain their dignity. In fact, what has occurred is essentially a new form of identification, which asserts that we are human beings. The refugees have been able to reconfigure the images of themselves as passive actors and weak subjects into active agents and fierce resistors. So that's just a last thought I leave you with, which is that even beyond the instrumental and intrinsic value of the right to hunger strike, um, another element, another facet of hunger strike that should be highlighted and um, that has a place in this uh, piece of political morality in uh, resisting oppression is the transformative value for the agent of experiencing such uh, collective acts of resistance to oppression. So there's a kind of prefigurative politics at play, prefiguration of democratic ideals by uh, enacting them in the uh, course of the protest and even a reconfiguration of present identity, which isn't a way of going back to who one was. It's really transforming uh, who one is, a kind of becoming. Um, that's all I have for you. I really look forward to the Q&A. Thank you.